Welcome to CNN Cleaning's Cleaning Chemical Class, where we talk about the chemicals that make cleaning clean. Today's subject is about the most talked about and least understood boosters used in our pre-spray chemicals and spotters, oxidizers. Oxidizers are both a powerful general purpose booster to our detergent recipes and a very useful spotter for organic soils. In this video, we're going to cover why they can be so good at both. Keep in mind, I try to stay at least a little out of the weedy details on these videos, so if you have more questions, please drop a comment. It's quite hard to simplify these concepts and still keep them as accurate as they need to be. So, on to the chemistry. There are actually two definitions of oxidizers. The first is the ox part of a redox reaction, or an electron transfer reaction where the oxidizer, as an electron acceptor, gains an electron from a reducing agent, which is an electron donor. An example of this is trisforbromyl... Trisfl trisfl uh, this stuff. A popular oxidizing agent in organic chemistry where it goes by its more common name, magic blue. The definition of an oxidizer that we are going to concentrate on here is as an atom transfer reagent. A more common usage where an oxidizing agent transfers oxygen atoms to a substrate. These oxygen atoms are technically an electron acceptor, but this definition is a little more general in that we are looking at specific transfers to oxygen atoms. So if we're looking at boosters that transfer oxygen atoms, one thing they gotta have to qualify is an oxygen atom. Can't give up what you don't have. Any oxidizer used to transfer oxygen is going to consist of one or more oxygen atoms bonded to one or more other atoms. In order to understand how this works, let's take a closer look at oxygen and why it may be special. Oxygen atoms never exist as a neutral element on their own, naturally anyway. Oxygen has a total of eight electrons around its nucleus, which means two in the inner valence ring and six in the second ring. This outer second ring likes to hold eight, so oxygen is either always going to naturally pair up with something in order to get that ring full, or steal two electrons from somebody to make it O2 minus and have a minus two electrical charge. When an atom has a non-neutral charge, it's known as an ion. This is also why a single oxygen pairs up so well with two hydrogens to make water. Each hydrogen only has one electron, so the three atoms together can all share happily and fill their valences. Anytime you put two hydrogens and an oxygen together, along with a little energy in the form of heat, the two are going to bond together to form water. This bonding actually occurs pretty aggressively. Hydrogen and oxygen joining together is what calls the explosion of the Hindenburg blimp. That's not really part of this video at all, I just like seeing explosions. For the purpose of this video, we're going to explore two popular oxidizing agents, hydrogen peroxide and its brother, sodium percarbonate. Hydrogen peroxide is the most simple peroxide, a chemical with an oxygen to oxygen single bond that looks like this. Well, you're a little creepy looking, let's try a hat. There, that's better. It is unstable and will decompose in the presence of light. Basically, a very low amount of energy is needed for H2O2 to release one of its oxygens, turning it into normal water and oxygen gas. Remember how oxygen is special, though? Once it's released, that oxygen is going to become a ruthless electron-stealing bandit, and that is where the basis for the work comes from. So let's talk about two of the things hydrogen peroxide is known for. Number one is as a disinfectant. That brown bottle that your parents always kept under the sink that foams on cuts is a 3% hydrogen peroxide solution. Side note, the bottle is brown to protect the hydrogen peroxide from light so that it has a longer shelf life. Mom always used to tell me that the bubbling was how you know it was working while she held me down to pour it all over my skin knees and I broke down in tears. But anyway, blood and most living cells can contain the enzyme catalase, which breaks H2O2 into water and oxygen. This breakdown would occur anyway, 
but the catalase speeds it up. Then the oxygen bandits are loose, trying to get back those two electrons to make themselves comfy again. To do this, they react with the cell walls of bacteria, and this kills the bacteria. Unfortunately, this also kills healthy cells surrounding the cut, which is why hydrogen peroxide is not recommended anymore to use for wound care. But it still works fine for general purpose disinfecting end because the end result is water, and because it degrades so quickly, it's much safer than a chlorine-based sanitizer. HP is also used as a bleach, which is the main reason why we, as cleaners, use hydrogen peroxide variants. At temperatures over 140 degrees Fahrenheit, hydrogen peroxide is an effective bleaching agent. Okay, disclaimer, bleaching is not a simple topic, but I'm going to give it a shot here. Deep breath. We've talked before about how organic materials are made of chains or rings of carbon atoms bonded to a few other atoms as well. The bonds between the atoms can be single or double bonds, and the arrangement of these bonds affects how light travels through a material, essentially determining its color. During the breakdown of H2O2 into H2O and O, the oxygen bandit is capable of breaking apart some of those double bonds, removing the color of the item by changing the way light is reflected or passes through it. Note that for this to work, the substrate generally has to be organic, which is why it's generally safe to use peroxides on synthetic materials, but more caution has to be taken before using on natural fibers. The way color can be affected by molecular bonding is a pretty deep topic that's really deserving of its own video. But for the purpose of this video, the takeaway is that peroxide application disrupts the bonds of organic carbon chains, which in turn changes how light reflects, thereby removing their color. Well, hydrogen peroxide is great, right? But as we mentioned, hydrogen peroxide is very unstable. It breaks down quickly in the light, and when mixed with water over 140 degrees, it immediately breaks down and causes a veritable shit ton of foam, right? So what if we could find a way to make hydrogen peroxide more useful to keep it stable on the shelf and to only react when we are ready? Enter sodium percarbonate. Sodium percarbonate is a solid material, a white coarse powder, that is obtained by crystallizing a solution of sodium carbonate and hydrogen peroxide. Sodium percarbonate is, by weight, 35% hydrogen peroxide. It is also stable when dry, colorless, and easily obtainable. I normally buy 5-pound bags off of Amazon, and it mixes easily with warm water. And when it is mixed with water... Sodium percarbonate yields hydrogen peroxide, sodium cations, and carbonate. We've already talked about the benefits of the hydrogen peroxide, and sodium carbonate on its own has several benefits as well, as a water softener, as an alkaline buffer, as a detergent additive, as a wetting agent. Pretty much any oxy booster, including over-the-counter boosters like OxyClean, contain some ratio of sodium percarbonate and so sodium carbonates, averaging a 65-35 mix. And that, kids, is how oxidizers play such an important role in our cleaning chemistry. They kill bad stuff, and they remove color from stains. Stay tuned for the next video in the series, where I have absolutely no idea what direction we'll go next. Please let me know what you think of the series so far in the comments, and like and subscribe so that I know you're out there. Thanks for watching.